So good morning once again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, which is a part of our uh, ongoing webinar series, Deep Dives with uh, IQ Experts. And today's webinar, as you know, is on the topic of climate risk and ESG. Climate risk is, uh, is, is, is absolutely a very, very important topic in current context. Every regulator actually is like working very hard uh, to ensure uh, all these regulations. So on that, actually, we would have a de detailed discussion. And uh, to discuss about this uh, uh, today's uh, topic, we have, or rather, we are extremely lucky to have with us Ujwal, Ujwal Dinesh. And he, he has started working a lot. I mean, in fact, he has recently done his SCR certification uh, on climate risk as well, right? So just to briefly introduce Ujwal, Ujwal has done his FRM, CFA, is an SCR, is an MBA from IM Calcutta. He is an engineer, has done his uh, PG diploma in securities law. And he, Ujwal is a techno-functional professional with more than 17 years of experience of which close to 11.5 years is across product control, FX, REITs, credit, equities, credit risk, Basel II, AIRB, and, and 3.5 years in automation-led transformation. So it's a varied experience and is currently working as a GM of one of the top MNC IT companies leading their change management team. He's a problem solver. He is an excellent motivator, uh, has a great proven track record of leading line product control teams. And during the course of his career, Ujwal builds strong culture of risk and control mindset for strong relationships, which I can vouch for. Uh, we are associated with Ujwal for what more than 15, 14, 15 years now. So, so essentially almost since inception of IIK So it's, with us also it has been a very, very long, close and deep relationship. And I mean, he has forged strong relationships with senior stakeholders across diverse geographies and functions and led change management while optimizing cost of delivery with various levers. So Ujwal has flair for driving transformation through process automation. And as I've said, we are extremely lucky to have him with us today and uh, uh, discussing this today's uh, a very important topic in context of current banking system, right? So before I hand over the session to Ujwal, uh, a basic lowdown on how we would be going about in today's session. The Discussion would be for about like uh, about 50 minutes to one hour, and post that uh, we would go into the Q&A. So uh, I would request all to post their questions in the in the in the, the the questions window. Unfortunately, since the participation is huge, so we can't allow uh, you the speaking right. But nonetheless, we want the session to be as interactive as possible. So please feel free to type in your questions, queries. Uh, follow-up queries and we would all happy to take up as much as we can right so we have a dedicated q a session for that and uh, so so yeah with that actually i mean i'm as excited to uh, go into the session as you all are so without uh, further ado uh, let's uh, start with this session and uh, which will i'm making you the presenter so whenever you are ready please uh, feel free to start Yeah, absolutely, Nitish. Uh, good morning, friends. Good morning, all. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a massive uh, number. Uh, thank you very much, all, for joining on a uh, weekend. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, that's uh, so so nice of yourself, Nitish, uh, for such kind words. Uh, of course, you're right. Uh, it's been a very long association with yourself and uh, and IQF, so that's something which, uh, it's a mutual learning uh it's a mutually enriching relationship so and and also uh yeah so, so good to see all of yourself friend so i will jump in straight uh straight away jump into the topic uh so of course so what i did was uh of course nothing is proprietary i would say right uh but having said that uh there is a uh, uh a lot of focus, a lot of action happening within the climate risk ESG space, as you can imagine. So I picked up from various different sources uh, for your benefit. So feel free to uh, chat uh, or, or ask any questions. Uh, but before that, uh, one quick thing, right? So I do not know if it is because of climate risk, uh, climate issues or something in November, in the place where I live near Hyderabad. I have rain, 
so it, it is quite weird right i mean we don't expect rains in november and uh, in fact one of the main things which uh, uh, like made me think through also so if you observe uh, this right uh, you yeah you can see my screen right i hope yeah yes yes so absolutely you, so so these are uh, there has been a lot of focus and as you can see some of the data points here so this is from wwf so it's quite an interesting graph uh, that they have come up with right what would be the impact with a 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees global warming uh every single celsius has quite serious impacts so you can see that you know if it is you know 2 degrees you have 170 percentage increase in flood risk 99 percentage of the coral reefs have a problem as compared to the scenario 1.5 degrees so which is why it is it is in amber but the two degrees is in red so 2.7 billion like our population world population itself is 7 billion right so these days i have seen a lot of heat waves or uh, the train tracks getting uh, contracted uh, in some parts of the europe uh, uh, floods happening in europe heat waves happening in europe uh and of course recently in pakistan there was a ma major 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 flood all of this uh there, there is certain amount of correlation now is it just a uh is it just an anchoring effect that is someone said that is because of climate and everyone is latching onto it or is it backed up by data right so one so this particular graph will actually tell uh this particular graph which actually uh, uh, tell uh, where where we see this yeah uh, so of course it's backed by data and there is heavy amount of research that has happened uh, so you can see the surface thermometer um, i mean there are there are multiple top down and bottom up approaches one is that you can actually what is climate climate is just a amalgamation of temperature precipitation humidity if you just check for weather any place so temperature is one of them and that's the reason why in uh, so air water oceans atmosphere these are the ones which makes earth a livable planet right as compared to the others but equally it is been proven that uh, in fact there was a very funny interesting experience uh, experiment that someone did way back in 1890s so what what the scientists did was to take all the gases like some of the top gases carbon dioxide oxygen nitrogen and all and start warming them it was observed that the the chamber in which carbon dioxide was there warmed up a lot more than the others apart from that there are other greenhouse gases what we call them as the fundamental approach towards climate is earth gets the Uh, uh, energy from sun right and earth reflects back most of it right so in that sense at least whatever is the usual room temperature that we have will main will be maintained but if we have greenhouse gases which is predominantly carbon dioxide methane and others they kind of trap the heat and that essentially means earth is not transferring are reflecting back the energy back to the sun which is the usual cycle so when the uh, gases trap the heat ultimately it heats up the earth also luckily 96 percentage of that is taken by the oceans and trees others but still there is certain amount of it is remaining so if you observe this graph surface thermometer as you can see from 1860 there were some observations so it has been increasing from satellite also the temperature has been increasing the sea extent has been decreasing the glacier ice is decreasing because it is getting melted right ocean heat content is increasing sea level is increasing so when you have sea level increase you have tsunamis you have flooding all of this right so there is been a clear indisputable proof that humans have contributed to this and there were other experiments also which said is it because of some other factors apart from humans but clearly the from the pre industrial times till date there has been a marked approximately the consensus estimate is 1.1 degrees has been the increase right so again i i don't know why it is yeah uh, so if you see this particular graph so this is all uh, 
the carbon dioxide, methane, the nitrous oxide, halocarbons, all of them. So global warming potential is, is basically like how much it heats up, right? And the fraction of the total greenhouse gases. So the left-hand graph tells us that, okay, carbon dioxide actually, luckily it is only it has only global warming potential of one, but it has got a timeline of 500 years. So an increase has been 130 parts per million. Methane and nitrous oxide actually have much more global warming potential. In fact, for non-vegetarians, uh, many much of the because of cows and other 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 uh, uh, you know livestock, basically they contribute a lot of methane through their own digestive systems. So in fact, one of the studies says to reduce the meat consumption at least by 20%. That will actually have a positive impact because people rear the livestock and all. So, but luckily their percentage is lower. So the top target, if you took a look at the right side one, the radiative forcing is essentially the same point that I mentioned, right? How much are they contributing to the overall uh, the surface temperature rise? Again, there is a total human contribution. Luckily, aerosols actually have a negative impact, but aerosol also have an impact in terms of it causes sneezing and other stuff for us, right? So luckily, aerosols through the many of the actions of the regulators, aerosols have been much more reduced, but the carbon dioxide still remain. So there have been many studies which said the SSP here refers to socio shared socioeconomic pathways. So these are the most often than not the de facto scenarios that have been developed by the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Uh, and also many other organizations. They are the ones which are leading this. So SSP-1 is basically like the most best scenario. SSP-2 is the most likely scenario, which is, see, what is the what is the trade-off here? The trade-off here is between economic growth versus emissions, right? Now, China, if you see, which I will, I'll, I'll talk about later also. So you want to have more growth, naturally, you need know, to create industries, you will, the, those industries which create pollution and vehicles, transportation. So if you observe any city in India or your, your towns which have grown these days, what is the biggest, uh, what is the biggest uh, demonstration of growth? The traffic jams, right? So there's always a trade-off between them. So there have been five scenarios defined. So SSP-1 is the best, SSP-2 is the most likely scenario, SSP-3 is with some inequalities, SSP-4 is with some conflict, SSP-5 is that. We don't care about climate, we just continue to do what we are doing, right? So if you see the atmospheric CO2 in SSP-1, it's the lowest, SSP-5 is the highest, right? Uh, emissions again are the highest in SSP-5, SSP-1 is the lowest. So the, there have been some scenarios which have been developed. All of this towards how do we mitigate the climate risk? But equally there is a concept of sustainability also that has been taken care of because it's not only environment, we also are looking at sustainability as a concept. So if you look at the left hand graph, right, uh, you can see there is quite a lot of overlap, right? So climate change impacts everyone. So sustainable business practices or sustainable investing, sustainable development, and sustainable consumption also. ESG is a particular aspect of that, which is environmental social governance, right? Which you probably have to test also. Now, there has been a lot of focus on this particular concept. They're slightly interchangeable, but sustainability is much more broader term, simply, simply put, right? Now, towards the right, we have the United Nations defined sustainable development goals. 17, I'll not go through all of them. So all of them talks about poverty, uh, quality education, uh, uh, reduced inequalities, but particularly 13 is climate action, 14 is life below water, 15 is life on land, right? And responsible consumption and production. So one of the things is that every person, all of us individually contribute. One, one, one of the studies says, if you stop taking the elevator in office, and by the way, I'm, I'm doing that in my office and at my home, it also helps your fitness. It also, you don't have to wait for the traffic, right? Uh, it actually reduces the carbon dioxide consumption because you're re, uh, using less electricity. Assuming that electricity is coming from the traditional fossil fuel sources, you can actually reduce uh, carbon dioxide consumption by a couple of kilos per, uh, per, 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 per uh, year, right? In your individual contribution. Now, of course, why it is becoming uh, more, more and more important 
is that it actually has a lot more impact. I mean, we studied in class uh, in, in science, right? Photosynthesis, uh, trees uh, gives us shade, they take the carbon dioxide and give us the oxygen. That is becoming more and more aware. I think we forgot because of the whole consumption, maybe the salaries have increased, maybe we are busy. But I think we, it's always good to go back because the peace that we get is a lot more. So but there is also a science to it. So these ecosystem services like the habitat, nutrient cycling, all of this actually help us in you know freshwater, timber, food, or it could also regulate floods. Mangroves, mangroves actually help regulate floods. And bees actually help pollinate. In fact, <coughs> in some of the countries, in order to grow avocados, they had to actually export the bees, like import the bees. Now that that is the level of situation that we are in, right? And of course the cultural aspect, right? So the typical ecosystems are wetlands, mangroves, grasslands. So uh, always the help in carbon storage or uh, or carbon storage within the soils, right? Or could also uh, retain the flood water, right? Uh, so so there is a certain science that is going on here. So one of the typical uh, sustainable, uh, one of the earliest companies which started. The sustainable reporting is Royal Dutch Shell. Ironically, they are the biggest emitters, by the way, right? So they are the biggest fossil fuel uh, emitters, but I think that at least shows that they are trying to do something about it, right? So if you see, I'll not read through everything, but but uh, so so on climate change, human activities, the use of oil fuels may be influencing the climate. So on 2019 letter, so they started first in 1997, but in 2019, the uh, demands have become louder. Now it has become much more louder. So, and the Paris Agreement basically is a congregation of all national entities uh, with a collective pledge to limit the human, uh, the global warming to 1.5 percent pledge. Now, and there is also some actual metrics which are put up for all the different uh, individual sustainable development goals. For example, we don't want any poverty. So, what are the material factors? It could be wages in operations, or it could be supply chains, quality edu education, access to education, or climate action, for example. What is the emissions intensity? What is the climate vulnerability? So these could be the metrics. Now, it is also this particular uh, case study, the left one. It is not just a, a high level discussion. People actually, there are many initiatives which are driving this. So, for example, so Nuvin is, is one of the asset management companies. They actually say how much of their, how many holdings they have, which will impact the affordable and clean energy. So, if you basically want investors to come to you, ESG screening has become more and more, or sustainability screening or ESG screening has become more and more important. So, in fact, the asset center management also, they have to report. To what extent they are aligning with one of the or one or many of the SDG goals, right? So you can see here 56 percentage of their holdings are on the affordable and clean energy, uh, right? And and that's energy is one energy and transport are the sectors, uh, energy uh, transport uh, are the sectors which uh, are the heavily influenced impacted ones because of this. And as you can see towards the right, there have been many different councils established. All business council, you know, UN Global Impact, Business Roundtable, Principles of Responsible Investing. So all of them have formed their alliances. But how can we uh, convert or how do we translate these high level climate? Okay, everyone knows that it's warming. So what do we do? So that's where the next point is, right? Uh, which is the climate change risk. So how do we move from a some kind of thin air into some particularly relevant ones. So let's look at this. So climate risk can be broken down into physical risk and transition risk. Physical risk is a direct impact. It could be acute and chronic. Acute essentially sudden. Chronic is slowly building up. So floods, cyclones and droughts are acute. Sea level rise, heat water, all of them are uh, chronic. Right. Uh, in fact, one of the studies mentioned that there could be a dip of two to two percentage or more uh, productivity of the employees. Imagine yourself, right? If you go to the office on a sunny day, you don't have air condition. Will you be able to work? 
It's difficult, right? And in a very chilly day, you don't have heating. It's, it's, it does get on to you at some point in time, right? So, now in a facility level, it can be impacting the infrastructure, residential property, or commercial facilities. At a corporate level, it could impact the supply chains, right? Uh, now, now, similar to, I don't know to what extent you are aware of credit risk, but it, similar to what we do in credit risk management, one is the exposure, another is the probability of default. So, in climate risk also, we have similar concepts. But what could be the drivers? It could be policy changes, there could be sudden carbon tax, suddenly someone says, okay, shut down the coal plants. Uh, in fact, you will see later, uh, many of the European banks have, are in the process or will be stopping funding for coal-based power plants by 2035 or 2038. Now, in India, many of our, I think we do have, uh, Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi has already mentioned that by 2030, they want to have 70% of renewable energy, but we are already in 2023. Which means in seven years, in seven years, in, imagine a situation where NTPC, National Thermal Power Company or Corporation, or many of the thermal power plants, if they have to be shut down, there is going to be agitation by the unions, there is going to be loss of livelihoods, and their skill sets also, uh, they need to be reskilled. So these are real, real issues. Luckily, in India, it is not a law yet. But in Germany, in some European countries, it is a law, which means it's just not words. It's actually law. So those, now if we suddenly say, okay, we will shut down, it will have, the situation will be like what happened in Sri Lanka. You probably may be aware, Sri Lanka suddenly, you know, moved to organic farming. It's a good thing. Organic farming, on, in theory, on paper, it's a very good thing. But you need to transition to that properly in a phased manner by in a in a planned manner it cannot be half that that's what transition risk is talking about technological changes so we will see later also where so the the cost of solar panels have been have decreased quite a lot so now with that what is the future right everyone we all know that in theory solar energy uh, a 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer Panel, 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer panel, which is just 2% or 1% of Earth's area, surface area, can power the entire Earth as per studies. But why is it not happening? Of course, it is. it, it has got to do with education, some lobbying, because obviously suddenly uh, you tell the uh, uh, NTPC employees or, or many of those old fossil fuel companies suddenly to shut down. There is going to be resistance, right? Because they they see everything is okay. What is the problem? But the problem is sustainability is defined as meeting the needs of the current generation without impacting the future generations. So we will be okay. What about next 50 years? That's the question. And hence we need to be responsible, right? So of course there will be consumer pressure. All of this kind of will lead to some exposure in terms of what could be the fossil fuel power plant, uh, internal combustion engines, right? And vulnerability. So, vulnerability essentially refers to how much you are impacted. Now, it could also, for example, if you look at the right hand side, <coughs> sea level rise and more frequent storms can reach, can give rise to greater risk of current and future flooding, right? Which will in turn give rise to lower property values. In turn, it might impact residential and commercial property mortgages, which in turn will affect the mortgage securitization or asset backed securities. So there is a transmission channel which has been defined, right? So if you see, I was mentioning about the price of solar panels, right? Since 1976, it has drastically reduced. So there is still a very good strong case for people moving to solar, right? And also wind and also hydro. But of course, there are other aspects which we need to be considering. For example, if you're building a dam, uh, what would be the impact of the livelihood or the risk of flooding, all of these things needs to be looked at. Now, if you look at the transition risk in a typical electricity generation, right? If you have a mandatory shutdown saying that no, no coal uh, based plants, it's a policy risk, right? Or, or there could be a technology risk also. So, because of the improvements in technology, the solar panel price has come down. Obviously, 
you will be looking more for that right which will lead to loss of revenues for the com current companies or asset write off which is called as planet assets and it could also impact lower returns and it could in, uh, uh, increase your default risk and also higher prices to the consumer so all of this that is the risk management aspect we are talking about right now if you if you look at now there are two theories one is that of course every year there is something called as conference of parties right now we are in cop 28 uh, which is basically all the countries uh, go through this negotiations so there has been discussions about okay who should be how does how does this work like the developed countries are basically pushing the developing countries like india i mean we are doing better but all brazil india indonesia all of these countries to cut down the emissions the argument of the developing countries is boss you have made your money you have gone grown rich by with these fossil fuels so you emitted a lot now you are asking me to cut down when i am trying to grow so right now the situation is china is obviously in the highest united states is still there india is the third so which means we are already moving to the 4 trillion economy apparently right? somewhere around that now if we have to go and us is at 25 trillion china is at 18 trillion so we are way behind them but if you want to move obviously it has to emissions will increase right uh, so one interesting uh, scientific aspect that has come out is it is the cumulative stock of the carbon dioxide that matters not who is emitting today so if you look at basis that logic <coughs> from a cumulative stock point of view north america has 29 percentage of emissions eu has 22 percentage of emissions china has 12.7 india is only 3 percentage so in that sense so hence the proportionality will apply more to these countries so that negotiations are still happening so that but but the key point to note is it is not the stock so today if you see china is the number one but but the stock wise usa has because imagine the stock as a layer in the atmosphere that is already there and as we saw before the lifetime of carbon dioxide is 500 years so it is already there now there are only two options one we stop immediately anything that is giving carbon dioxide and it has to lead to some negative emissions which means we need to suck out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it somewhere and it's called as carbon sequestering sequestering is a latin word for surrendering so either uh, we have to i mean there are many technologies that have come up right uh, so some some funky technology talks about uh, reacting the carbon dioxide with some uh, some acids in the atmosphere which causes rain so many other different concepts are and some say that okay uh we we kind of capture it and store it under the ground so yeah th those technologies are still like in a nascent stage so but what could be how do we achieve that so it could be through carbon tax or emissions trading scheme so emission trading scheme is very much widely used in europe basically like there is a uh, it goes the every year the target uh, the quota which you are allowed to have will continue to decrease so if you are doing a great job you will be using less than your quota which you can actually sell it to some other person who might be in need and there are some renewable portfolio standards so which clearly mandate certain percentage of the electricity to be from renewable energy sources or it could be fuel tax or ban or all of this right so different policies are there now the way and in fact the companies are also now these days required to to report the emissions so if you see uh, so carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide hydrofluorocarbons perfluorocarbons sulfuric acid sulfur uh, all of them are the greenhouse gases now interestingly there is a focus on obviously what you cannot measure you cannot mitigate right from a risk management point of view so uh, all the emissions are usually uh, uh, this is a greenhouse gas protocol based approach which is scope 1 scope 2 scope 3 scope 1 for direct emissions so that is the reporting company for example if you are a bank so you on your own do not generate emissions but in a bank you have 
uh, you are using electricity and that electricity you are purchasing it from a coal based power plant so that is what is called a scope 2 right now there could be scope 3 where your vendors or your suppliers might be using that or business travel by your associates all of these are scope 3 so there are some standards which are revealed but let the point is that scope 1 2 3 we will see later also uh, every bank or every institution has to report right so and even regulators are ramping up their responses so bank of england so so they integrate the climate related risks in their macro prudential policy and micro prudential policy micro prudential essentially talks about <clears throat> at the micro level managing the banks hey what is your emissions how much have you funded uh, how much green fund and financing have you done what is your personal contribution macro level talks about the interest rate all of this right so so there has been a nice paper called a strategy of horizon which kind of uh, shifted the whole focus <coughs> they want to reach uh, net zero emissions by 2050 right so in fact they in 2021 they've started a biennial exploratory scenario which is basically stress testing uh so let the point is that uh tcfd is is one keyword which will uh, uh you will be hearing related to climate risk which is called as task force for climate related disclosures now on the same line okay we want to act, uh, we want to address climate risk okay but how oh, it needs money right obviously right you need you need to if suddenly some you, you are encouraging everyone to go to uh i don't know how many of you know there is a national hydrogen policy that has been rolled out with some investment uh and probably india is one of the earliest ones or probably one of the good ones so essentially they are trying to move towards hydrogen based uh power but the problem with hydrogen based power and that's why the technology needs to be improved for the technology need to be improved and to be safe you need to invest so there have been news about all electric scooters catching fire correct so there is still a certain amount of fear in people's mind and that requires education that requires demonstration of safety uh hydrogen uh, uh there was <coughs> first ever hydrogen based aircraft called as hindenburg which was the first and the last experiment with a hot air gas balloon uh it was called uh so basically it's like a flight powered by hydrogen but unfortunately hydrogen is so inflammable a small static electricity because of rubbing effect or friction caused the entire passengers and everyone to die so that technology is still, so but, but we do have a natural hydrogen policy but it requires a lot of time to, to to make to that level but luckily we are seeing and increasing the investments up to 600 billion dollars <coughs> so this one if you see the typical landscape uh so governments are basically giving a lot of funding in this right uh, so national level is 132 billion uh, uh, uh multilateral corporations like nation development bank or commercial financial institutions have been putting 573 billion but the typical sectors if you see the bottom one renewable energy has got the highest amount of funding followed by low carbon transport so which is where the funding is going but how is these bonds or green instruments different so in fact there is a logic again for that there are standard principles so green bond essentially has four component the green bond principles they are called as what is the use of proceeds what is the process for project evaluation what is the management of process and how do we report so and and, and they need to be and they, they need to be they they they, they need to be uh, focused and they need to be uh, followed in order to get the funding now there is also a group about uh, sustainable bonds beyond green so green bonds and social bonds are slightly different so sustainability bonds so green bonds simply put focus only on the environment predominantly social bonds focus on the social impact sustainability is much more broader so again, there is a very good increase in all of them which is a positive sign and there are some exchange traded sustainable equity etfs also that are being traded so net net 
yeah net net uh, there is a lot of focus uh, which is emerging on this and of course there is uh, green and sustainable finance uh, uh sustainability link note uh, which are also coming up a lot right uh, so there have been many many uh, so in fact the sustainability link loan is quite interesting which basically looks at uh, what is the relationship to borrower what is the target setting uh, what is the reporting and they have a certain target Able to see my screen now? Yes, yes, it's visible. Please start. Okay, okay, okay. Friends, thank you very much for staying back. I promise to uh, not uh, disappoint you. So, so, yeah. So, okay. So, so we were talking about climate risk, right? Uh, so there are many sustainability. So sustainability linked is loan is different from a green bond. The difference is. There are some KPIs and targets that are actually set up in order to take a sustainability link loan. So your interest rate might might uh, might become favorable uh, if you are doing a good job. Right? That means your interest rate might get reduced. But if you are not meeting your sustainability objectives, your interest rate might <coughs> increase later. Right? So now, if you see there is a heavy focus on integrating the ESG components also. So how does it happen? So there could be companies which do not have any internal ESG expertise. Some companies which can have a separate ESG research department. And some where ESG is partly integrated and all decisions and stuff. Uh, so, so of course, if you see this particular graph, you can see that corporate ESG ratings uh, are, are wi pretty widely used and direct engagement with companies uh, are the next uh, leading factor, right? Uh, equally, many of the uh, asset managers are increasing their use through the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board framework, right? So, 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 So again, the, the, the portfolio or the lead portfolio manager or analyst for a company evaluates the firm in detail. And then they use the ESG ratings in order to screen for the companies, right? And uh, some of the screening criteria is also given by the EU taxonomy. So EU taxonomy is basically European Union's taxonomy. For example, what is green? Now, you might have seen Swiggy and other companies talking these days when you are ordering climate neutral deliveries, right? Or climate uh, green deliveries, Zomato, Swiggy. Now, I really doubt on that claim, for example, in one sense, it could be a potential greenwashing. So, what is greenwashing? Making claims that you're green when you're actually not doing anything for that. Now, for example, at least my logic says <coughs> you are using petrol or diesel based bikes to deliver then how is it climate neutral right so these questions needs to be understood and and this this topic so greenwashing is a predominant biggest issue where people are just putting the thing green but without actually doing any work right so so i mean there might be a day when 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 uh, the regulators might come very heavily on on certain kind of labeling right now you of all the countries, European Union has the highest or the be, uh, most comprehensive framework as of now. Uh, for those interested, I will share the framework. Nitish can share with all of the participants also. So, for example, cement manufacturing, let's say. In cement manufacturing, of course, you need to crack down a lot of limestone, heavy industrialized mechanized process. So, what consider what is considered green? So if you want to apply for that, so the clinker manufacturing uh, metric is 0.76 tons per 
tons of CO2 per ton of clinker. So if your CO2 generation is less than this, then you are green. Passenger railroad transport. What could be the, how do we demonstrate? Increasing the number of low and zero emission fleets and improving the efficiency. Again, the trains are eligible if direct emissions are below 50 gram CO2 per passenger kilometer. Similarly, the co-generation threshold will be reduced or anaerobic digestion of sewage sludge. All of these are highly technical. These are actually called as the technical standards. So uh, if you, if you uh, uh, look at, I, I will just show you one more uh, article which is quite a impactful and interesting one. Uh, so I'm just bringing up my screen back again. So I hope you are able to see my screen. So this is a 593 pager. It's a highly technical annex. So basically for every industry, they need to claim and prove how they are green. So for every industries, they will be given some criteria. Okay like the one that I just showed sample. So, uh, very interesting one. Very interesting one. And uh, you probably can uh, go through it, right? And there are, uh, and it's not just uh, high level gyan, but, but, but quite serious metrics that have been put up uh, in order for someone to claim that they are green. Now, of course, so for example, right? EU benchmark for iron and steel manufacturing are if it is a hot metal, 1.328 tons of CO2 per ton of product. If you are emitting more, you are not green. Like iron casting. So you can see there are quite specific values that have been put up for every industry, right? So yeah, I'll share this. It's quite, quite, quite interesting. Now, again, just like what we saw before, how will this transmission, the transmission is what is something from a climate risk analyst point of view. You probably might need to come up with if anyone who's who's interested in this right so yeah from a weather data or climate model projections you can get the sea level uh, uh uh rise and more frequent storms all of this right then you can get the topographical maps and data on flood defenses which also will kind of increase your overall risk and then you need to also get the empirical data on price effects of sea level exposure or geographical variation, right? Uh, it can also give rise to cross correlation in portfolio or duration in exposures uh, or effects on residential and commercial property mortgages because ultimately you are owning a house, but if your house value is reducing, then you cannot pay the EMI also, right? And that might impact on the markets also. So this is the transmission channel. So in fact, there have been many risks uh, that have been elucidated in terms of operational risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, underwriting, or insurance risk. So, how will the whole focus here is, for example, if it is operational risk, you can have physical risk leading to more frequent and more severe extreme weathers. Transition risk can be there, but it's limited. It's considered to be limited. If it is credit risk, the key metrics are probability of default, loss given default, exposure default. Physical risk can loss cause property damage, lead to loss of revenue, lower profits, and hence probability of default is increasing. Similarly, transition risk. Let's say you are doing a great job. Now, for example, I'll give a simple example. Kodak, it's called as a Kodak moment. Kodak was the biggest company of making films, right? We all might be remembering in the old days, we used to take this photo, put the film into the camera, take the camera roll and take the photo. Now it's all digital, correct? Do we see Kodak? No, Kodak is gone. So if you were invested in Kodak or if you were a bank who gave money to Kodak, you would have been at a loss now. So they could not adapt to the, the latest digital technology. So then Kodak, let's say, probably has this film manufacturing plant. It is worthless now, right? Because no one is using films. So then that asset is considered to be stranded because it is no longer uh, generating any revenue. So that's a big risk, right? 
so it is a significant risk liquidity it could be because of there could be sharp repricing and sudden market revaluation impacts so a climate minsky moment essentially it is called as like abrupt and sharp volatility in the markets so in fact uh, of course earthquake is not related to climate risk but any earthquake or any flooding or any kind of those kind of events are sure to shake up the market right so you will have liquid risk for underwriting insurance risk for example you are trying to get a house insurance right but that house is very close to sea as compared to a place which is not close to the sea obviously the insurance premium that you pay will be higher as compared to the person who is not exposed to the sea level increase risk so and of course market risk also is significant there could be market wide repricing or sovereign risk so all of them essentially are the risk transition mechanisms right so again so you, you can see increased temperature it could diminish the worker productivity it could also lead to people risk more frequent floods business chain supply uh, or disruption it could also increase the external risk or essentially that essentially is what is called as moving the probability of default in fact uh, in in uh, in in one of the banks ing bank for example or many of the other banks in european banks it climate risk assessment is a clear component of the entire credit risk portfolio assessment number 1 and number 2 is number 2 is uh, it is like a strict criteria that is being followed so climate value at risk also just like value at risk for market risk or value at risk for credit risk or operational risk we now also have climate risk uh, or climate war and depending on different different industries right uh, so of course coal electricity companies because they are the most uh, so it is meant to capture rough estimate of climate related financial losses so naturally the people or the companies which are heavily energy dependent are the ones which are constructions coal electricity are the ones which are impacted so as you can see the, from a zero climate risk they have much more probability of losses so this is another concept now increasingly there is a lot of disclosures that are required at an asset level on carbon footprint at a much more granular level because of this there is because of this there is a lot of focus uh, so for example in the old school there is only data form uh, electricity generation company and you just need a corporate level disclosure and based on that you will get investment and lending decision but now with ex extremely high level of reporting requirements and all of this right so you need to have a power plan but you also need to have other sources of energy in order to reduce your carbon footprint it could be wind farm it could be power plant and take the data from satellite data from open sources data sets and get the plant level facility level emissions and only then you get the investment so that is the level at which people so which means more climate risk analysts are required so that means more careers in esg or climate risk so there is if you looked at if you look at linkedin uh the scr certification which uh, which i recently did and which uh, nitish also was alluded into you will see lot of action on this right and because it is become a regulatory mandate especially in the europe in india in other places it will come but it is a bit slow so to the extent that so ing this is another case study <coughs> there is a supervisory board at the top which actually looks at every investment and every lending decision from a sustainability point of view is this negotiate transaction from the first line of transaction even the relationship managers are tasked and they are uh, and i personally saw that there is lot of focus in terms of upskilling of people and looking everything at sustainability lens to the extent that ing has also come up with climate report recently on october 5th and many of the banks are also starting to do that apart from the financial report so you can imagine and it's actually an objective of the cfo also to deliver that report so you can imagine the extent at which it is becoming which we will talk about so 
But what is it? Ultimately, everyone wants to be net zero. What do you mean by net zero? That means whatever emissions we did, emissions we did, boss. Okay. Now we don't want to do any more further extra emissions. So there could be emissions from the land usage, from land and ocean. There could be sinks. So there should it should be sustainable. That means whatever we are generating, it should be put in a sink, like so that there is no net additional impact of carbon dioxide addition. But there are some scenarios which I showed in the first step also. Between 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees increase. There is an exponential increase in the impact. So, so from 14 percentage to 37 percentage will be the increase. The proportion of people who will have a severe heat wave. So 1.5 degrees would likely lead to 70 to 90 percentage of the reduction in average coral cover, coral reefs and all. It would prevent, but in 2 degrees it's all wiped out. And the probability of droughts are extremely high. And the 10 million people are at an additional estimated risk of flooding. So this is the situation now. Now there have been many interesting plans in order to come out of this. So this is the plan, by the way, for uh, made by Germany. So right now, 858 metric tons. Let's say the blue one the, at the most top left, right? 2018 to 2050, they have created a plan. So right now, if they're at 858 tons, right? So they want to pull, phase out the coal by 2030 and move to 70% as renewable. So that would reduce 200 tons. And 14 million electronic cars, electric cars, 30% of them should be the one, at least the norm. Industries, they want to reduce uh, green retrofit rate at 1.6% per year. That means if you have 100 houses, at least two houses start need to be retrofitting. Agriculture, all of them with that reduction by 2030, they plan to come to, which is seven years from now, they plan to come they reduce it by 65 percentage to 438 tons, but still more work is remaining. So, in industry again, hydrogen based, like what we did in India, also they are coming up with the hydrogen based uh, power. Energy 100 percent is renewable. Transport they are saying 100 percent is electrification of cars. And then by 2045. They want to create negative emissions. So BECCS, carbon capture and storage, all of them are different. DACCS are all are different carbon capture technologies and green polymers. So, okay, okay. Interesting concept, right? So essentially they want to come down to negative emissions. That means they will capture some of the existing atmosphere also. Now imagine how practical is this situation. It requires heavy amount of policy push oversight and also individual efforts. So you also can contribute to that. Rather than <coughs> taking, so I started doing that. Rather than taking a lift, I'm doing it, you know, or take the walk, right? If you have to travel distances, take a public transport as opposed to using your own car, right? Try to plant trees to the extent we can, right? And of course, reducing meat consumption also reduces uh, carbon dioxide or, or methane indirectly. So this also helps our health also, right? So now there is another, at a global level, there is a plan also that is put up. So interestingly, this is put up by the International Energy Association. So the top green ones are basically related to buildings. So what they are saying is, again, the target for everyone is 2050 net zero. But 2050, people think that over oh, 2050, yeah, nah, so we will wait. But then there is a report which says that the coal usage will peak by 2030. After that, it will stop. So, but it will not stop automatically. We need to collectively make it stop, right? Can we all try to use solar in our own homes or some other alternative forms of renewable energy, even to some extent? Can we stop? Uh, it also helps reduce our electricity bill, right? Can we try to? To reduce the fan consumption or air condition consumption whenever it is not required or water consumption so all of these are small small steps we can do so 2025 no new sales of fossil fuel boilers like with, with, within two years by 2035 most appliance 
and cooling systems are best in class. <coughs> By 2040, all of our buildings, so including our apartments, will need to be retrofitted. And by <coughs> and in terms of the orange line, orange box, the second line, 60 percentage of global car sales are electric. Only then we will be able to achieve this. Even if you look at India, hardly while it is increasing, I think it's hardly within five percentage or so, right? Now, if we in seven years, if we have to move to 60 percentage electric vehicles, you can imagine the amount of push. In the US, there are subsidies also. So, and by 2035, no new internal combustion engine car sales. So, what will happen to our current cars? That also is a transition risk. So, if you start thinking now, something might be helpful. <coughs> so that all of this, you know, I will, I'll share this anyway. So, essentially, by 2050, 70 percentage of electricity should be solar or wind. So, again, only then we have a chance to be 20, net zero. Now, there is another angle to that. What if, if you don't do? By the way, there would be an impact on the GDP also. It is not a good to have. It has become like a must to have. So we will talk about it. So there are multiple scenarios that have been put up by the net zero associations. So if you see all of them are talking about peak emissions by 2030. And NGFS is again, which is national greening of the financial system. So this is again a very big think tank where they defined three scenarios. Orderly scenario, which is where people do all of this in an orderly way. Climate policies are introduced early and gradually tightened, leading to a steady fall. A disorderly scenario, they are introduced later and more abruptly. Then it's a problem. Hot house, we do nothing. Then obviously there is no net zero that will be achieved. So, so there are different scenarios, right? So, like physical risk transition is we spoke about. So, what are the scenarios? These could be the usual conception scenarios design. Like what could be the parameters? So what would be the carbon price of energy demand and mix, geographic variation, climate system sensitivity, right? And what could be the analytical choices of this scenario design? It could be what is the choice of climate hazard? Do we take heat as the hazard or a flood as a hazard or extreme weather as a hazard? What is the time scale? 2030, 2050, 2100. So what is the output that we want in the scenarios? The usual financial outputs, earnings or profits, revenues costs how badly will the assets be uh, impacted what is the asset allocation what is the potential impact on productivity all of them right so those could be the ones which will impact this now pacta is paris alignment capital transition assessment this is one of the assessment frameworks that are used for banks right so the two key metrics, the two key metrics that are used are absolute production metric output, right? Uh, which is okay. How will you reduce the output? And also to look at identifying the shift from high carbon to low carbon technologies. So which is given by production volume trajectory and technology fuel mix. So if you observe friends, by the end of this webinar, you'll actually see that they are moving from more qualitative to more quantitative measures. So if someone says I'm green, you have solid data points you need to prove, by the way. So Citibank also has done a scenario analysis, says that, okay, fine, one in 25 chance, like four percentage chance of a tropical storm, or a one in 100, or a one percentage chance of uh, a, a, a hurricane so these are required to be assessed so people will start when they start thinking that is when things will change right now if you look at the top most the top, top right corner you can see the cumulative gdp impact from physical risk if we don't do anything potentially the gdp can reduced by 25 percentage in 2100 
so it is not just a good to have goody goody stuff but through the various physical risks and its impact through the transition into credit operational market risks there could actually be serious financial losses so and this framework is given by the ngfs which is a grouping of all the central banks by the way so if central banks are telling you something it's important that we do right and in fact it is now become a regulatory imperative in fact one of the quiz questions that nitish has put up the first question the european central bank will start fine finding the top 20 banks for every day of non compliance with the climate related measurement aspects and their status so it is become very very important so transition risk and physical risk which we spoke but from at a micro level it will impact the businesses to through property damage or changing demand and cost or legal liability or it could also impact the households through loss of income property damage and others the macro level it could also impact capital it, uh, capital depreciation increase in investment or it could be shift in prices from structural changes or productivity changes from severe heat or diversion of investments to mitigation or labor market frictions for example and then with all due respect the israel hamas war which which of course is unfortunate the main reason is for land right so imagine something gets very scarce that you can see conflicts also increasing so there is a reason right all of them eventually there is a feedback loop you can see here uh will give rise to credit risk due to default by businesses and households and collateral depreciation because you give a collateral a property worth one crore but because it is not meeting the energy standards so what if tomorrow all of our houses what if tomorrow any of the bank says that only if you are energy efficient we will give you funding now that might happen very soon it is already happening in europe by 2030 there is certain grades that they have which i will talk about they will not give funding to uh, people below certain ratings so just like our cb score there will be potentially a esg score for all of us also so it could also create underwriting risk which i spoke about liquid risk right now <clears throat> while officially the banks are not yet required to keep capital For example, did they consider physical risk? Yes. Uh, transition risk? Yes. What is the time horizon? So usually the climate risk time horizon is a lot more than a credit risk time horizon. So climate risk horizon will be more probably at 30 years, right? Because so you can see the time horizon is 30 years in Bank of France and 30 years in Bank of England, but only five years in Dutch National Bank because this is still an evolving topic. Number of scenarios, they have taken three different scenarios. Someone take four transition variables which is energy technologies and climate policies physical variables some people take the global and regional temperature pathways so as i mentioned again orderly transition early and decisive policy action that means not like good to have but must to have what if tomorrow it is told that boss you cannot buy a diesel engine but if you buy an electric vehicle you will get a 30 percent subsidy Obviously, people will shift towards it, but that requires a gradual, slow policy decision and strict implementation, right? Disorderly, obviously, people suddenly wake up. Not today, in 2023, but 2030, they will suddenly re realize that. But by that time, whenever you do something urgently, like the way Sri Lanka did with organic farming, it will create disastrous results. Hothouse scenario, obviously, is not expected only. So, in fact, during COVID, because of, <laughs> I mean, that was probably the first time Delhi had the most cleanest air, right? And many of us had reduced pollution. So, of course, it impacted the GDP, but it increased the renewable energy demand. There was 8% emission reduction. So, this could also be a very good scenario, but it was forced upon us, not that we wanted it, right? 
but just to put a point i'm sharing this now while we discussed the entire framework we are specifically getting into the case study of one of the banks and this is directly picked up from their own annual report not annual report sorry their own climate report so in fact they that is the responsibility of the cfo to bring out the annual report so in fact ing has brought out 115 pages climate report and and this has become like a most important so you can see what is the ceo saying climate change is a fact 150 years right so he is only very clear on that so we want to remit the global warming to 1.5 percentage so it, if this is the and they have put a certain targets to themselves in terms of how we want to do so it is a serious effect that's the point i'm just trying to make it so some interesting insights that we can glean from this particular case study is so of course they have particularly terra terra is the approach i mean terra essentially is the latin for land so uh, so it's an approach that they have taken in terms of how do we how are they aligned so and they are transparent in sharing this <coughs> they oil and gas power automotive shipping these are the ones and what the what ing did was they took at the sectors which are the biggest contributors of carbon dioxide and started attacking them in terms of how do we reduce it now right so oil and gas power automotive shipping they are on track steel aviation cement like amber residential real estate because residential real estate it is like our situation right uh obviously individual home owners need a lot more support to transition to green energies as opposed to large corporates so that is why it's on red so so they mobilized 100 billion financing volume and 500 approximate sustainability deals and in fact they had from 2015 since the paris agreement they have stopped the new financing of coal fired power plants sustainability linked bond they have generated in with philips 2019 they have already gone into uh, commitments so they also joined the net zero banking alliance 2022 they have put up some targets and they wanted to mobilize 125 billion of financing for clients for transition sustainable seal principle have been created 2023 they have joined the partnership for carbon accounting financial so this is again friends this will be a big thing in terms of how do we account for carbon again another uh, aspect so and they are also co developing new climate alignment financing principles for aluminum sector and they have a commitment to restrict for new oil and gas fields that's it so you can imagine things are moving in the direction so of course the typical environmental social factors the social is basically well being and interest of people and communities and everyone governance factor or corporate governance related factors right so, so they have clear goals also in terms of the short term till 2025 to reduce for example the carbon dioxide emissions by 75 percentage or upstream uh the oil and gas portfolio reduction target by 2025 sustainable finance target by 2025 and in the long term they have the target by 2050 so again this is similar to the ngfs uh, uh infographic that we saw the transition and physical risk will impact through the economic channels the credit risk market risk underwriting risk this is again from the ing's uh, uh, balance sheet so that's a very good framework that the ngfs has created so now you can see they are specifically also showing in the financials in terms of the left hand the table to tells us what is the gross carrying amount what is the exposure to that and also secondly they are also telling the transition heat map okay of your upstream oil and gas for the highest transition risk all others are medium transition risk ppc is basically energy performance certificate so it tells how green your building is so abc is considered to be the best unfortunately due to data quality issues there is a no label for 60 percentage of them but eventually essentially by 2030 they will stop they will not give funding to anyone below anyone who is in the efg rating 
So if 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 it's if Indian banks also start to do that, imagine what would be the situation. What they are saying is, hey, it's not that we want, we will not give, but we will give if you give a commitment that you will become energy efficient. For that, you might have to retrofit with some wind or solar panel or something like that, right? But for that, there is an investment. So the logic is, okay, I will help you with some, you also do some, yeah. <clears throat> and the typical risk drivers, they have put it in their annual report also, so credit risk. Uh, so they have to, what we do to manage risk, they have to actually share that to the regulators, right? Climate risk drivers have been incorporated in risk identification. In market risk also, they are integrated into the liquidity and market risk identification. Uh, so this is a compulsory stuff for them. So the another interesting way they did was to look at all the different sectors and look at the different value streams. So for example, which contribute a lot more to the climate or, or the carbon dioxide emissions. In power generation, for example, in power, so power generation as compared to distribution and electricity off takers are the highest risk. In oil and gas, again, upstream and midstream have the highest risk, but the trading will not generate so much of carbon dioxide. In cement, again, steel production, <coughs> as opposed to recycling and suppliers will have the highest. So they are attacking, so for example, aviation. Airline services, because they kind of use a lot of fuel, more than the suppliers and airplane manufacturers have the highest amount of carbon dioxide. So like that, the bank is attacking. The particular value stream where the generation is the highest. And they are also counting the employees also individually in terms of what is the total carbon generated by them. So all of this has to be disclosed. The final one, the Terra toolbox which I mentioned. So all the different sector and what is the outstanding amount right, that they have put in and what is the methodology that they are using. So PACTA, Paris, Paris Aligned Climate Transition Agreement is predominantly the one that is used by all of these industries, right? And what is the metric that they are using? How much of kilogram of carbon dioxide is emitted per megawatt of power generated or per ton of cement generated or per vehicle kilometers or per passenger kilometers? Or if it is commercial and residential real estate, how much of carbon dioxide is generated per meter square? And they have used the different scenarios. The pathway is basically, okay, what is the, like, will it be up, upswing or downswing? And then they look at the alignment score. So green essentially means they are in line with the target. So for example, in automotive industry, they are less by 12.5 percentage. In power generation oil gas, they're pretty good. But in residential real estate, they are not, I mean, that is what they showed earlier also, they are red, right? So that's the way they are tracking at an individual level. Now, of course, there are many transactions that ING has done. Uh, in the first slide, we saw 500 uh, approximately or uh, transactions that they have used, right? So, so the focus is more on what is that we can do to improve the funding towards green and sustainable finance, right? So that's the whole uh, uh, story which ING is, is trying to uh, looking to do, right? So net net in summary, climate risk is a significant risk which is mandated now as a part of the risk management practices of the bank. And climate risk is primarily driven by carbon dioxide emissions that is being known or greenhouse gases. There is a lot of disclosures reporting requirement or frameworks like PCAF or PACTA or greenhouse gas emissions that is required. And it's a legal mandate now. There is a plan. If you, if you want to do, we need to reduce drastically by 2030. Don't wait till 2050. And it is also important that it is done in an orderly way so that the banks or the there is less transition risk. And if we, if we don't do, the most important thing is there could also be reduction in the overall GDP by 25 percentage, notwithstanding the other effects that we are already having. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, there is quite an exciting thing, and from a career point of view, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it will be there. It is, we, the industry needs climate risk professionals who understand this. Uh, so, so that is something which you might want to look at 
uh, it's certainly a value added certification in addition to your CV, right? And, and there's a lot more roles that we are expecting to come also in this space because predominantly it requires, I mean, these days there is a chief sustainability officer also whose job not only is like just the qualitative stuff, but also the quantitative climate war and climate risk analysis and climate related funding. So they need to be able to provide a decision. Yeah. So, so I'll stop here, friends. Uh, I'm happy to take any other questions. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, first of all, like, thanks. Uh, that was uh, really an insightful session. And uh, as as uh, you were rightly mentioning, right? So uh, that 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 uh, I mean, climate risk actually the importance that you have explained, and then uh, it can be a separate career as well within risk, right? And for those who are interested, so uh, I mean, as you all know. IAQF has been a for, at the forefront of quant and risk management education in India. So we are the oldest body in this field. And uh, in this climate risk is something also we, we, we are actually very excited about. Like, And we, we are bringing a lot of things uh, in this area as well. First of all, climate risk will be included as like a party, part of uh, one of our course, uh, the certificate program in quantitative finance and risk management, the, the the comprehensive quant and risk management course, right? So climate risk is already in the process of being included in the curriculum of that. So from the uh, next cohort onwards, uh, which starts from 6th January, so from this cohort onwards, we would have climate risk in the curriculum of that course. We would be conducting a specialized customized training on climate risk, and uh, initially we would have uh, uh, self-paced pre-recorded uh, based uh, uh, training program anybody interested can join in most likely we will put that up in january or february uh, so anybody wanting to understand climate risk in more detail uh, we would have a separate course for that and uh, in, in general also i mean anybody wanting to make a career in uh, risk management uh, you can always uh, uh, look at our uh, other 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 courses, right? So we have very comprehensive courses in this uh, area of quant and risk, as you all know. Uh, so th there are certificate programs which you can look at. If anybody having interest in any area related to advanced financial analytics, I mean, uh, you have this uh, part-time certificate programs which are very comprehensive, both teaching the theory plus the practical modeling. I mean, anybody interested in risk particularly can look at this course of quantitative finance and risk management, uh, which teaches uh, uh, deep dives into both theory and practical modeling for derivative valuation and risk. And uh, I mean, somebody wanting to go into deeper uh, quantitative aspects, they can look at financial engineering certificate program, seven months course, which again, deep dives into both theory and practical mathling, mathematical modeling for derivative valuation and risk management. Machine learning in finance is another course that we have started doing and uh, anybody wants to specialize in machine learning for finance, that's also another deep course to look at. And then there are algorithmic trading courses for people who are specifically interested in learning about algorithmic trading, right? So, I mean, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, that has come up and of course we will be uh, happy to take up all the questions as I've mentioned, I mean, now also those those who wish to put up their questions they can actually uh, keep, keep, keep typing in your questions we'll be happy to take up those questions as well in the meantime the the questions that has already come up so ujwal i'll take the questions uh, one by one right and uh, I'll, I'll collate it for you so uh, if you are ready then i mean i i i'll just take the questions one by one All right, so Ujwal, am I audible? Uh, Ujwal, can yeah, you hear me? This, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, so what is the question? No, no, so I, I, I was just waiting for your confirmation. So I, I, I was not getting it. Okay, yeah, I'm okay, so I'm basically, okay. if you could share the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the first question is from Ansul and uh, he is a management student from BHU uh, and his question is sir what is CDP and TCFD and how it will help to ESG decisions 
The question is, what is CDP? Uh, CDP, C yeah. for and for Canada. CDP and TCFD. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So TCFD is basically task force for climate and climate finance and related disclosures. CDP right. is carbon deployment pool. They are part of the climate risk uh, learning process. So TCFD is the predominant entity for disclosures. All the disclosures that many banks are making are on the basis of TCFD recommendation only. Number one. Number one. So base. So these are uh, frameworks which are helping to advance the climate risk. Just to uh, share with that, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. So I hope that answers your question. And uh, uh, if you have any follow-up question, then please feel free to uh, uh, add to that. So we would we'll take it up again. So in the meantime, let's go to the next question, uh, which is from Saurav. Uh, so just give me a moment. So he has asked, like, are all the sovereign bonds, does India have these bonds as well? I mean, you mentioned about the sovereign bonds. So he was asking in follow up on that, actually. Right, right. Yeah, so India does have sovereign bonds. Uh, of course, that is why uh, the Fitch and the Bodies, we are unfortunately in the B, uh, double B range. So uh, India does have sovereign bonds, and India also, uh, uh, in a sense, predominantly it is driven by financial related parameters. But if a company is not, at least we are aligned with the Paris 1.5 degree uh, uh, Celsius uh, limitation, right? So, in that sense, the impact on our rating because of climate uh, policy or climate regulations will be minimal because we are on the track and we are doing the progressive steps, be it national hydrogen policy. Or, or or the push towards uh, or our our pledges towards net zero in the Paris Climate Agreement. So the minimal the impact on our sovereign bonds will be minimal. That's what I expect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I hope that answers your question, right, Saurav? And I mean, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to uh, type in. In the meantime, going to the next question is from Surjendu. Surjendu has asked. Under the sustainability that many organizations are practicing, greenwashing approach. Please put a discussion on that. Yeah. How it could be mitigated or minimized. So, uh, I mean, uh, would you would you like to take that question? Yeah, yeah absolutely, Mitesh. Sujendu, thank you for asking that question. So, actually, I already referred to this, right? <coughs> so, there are two things. Two actual interesting concepts. One is greenwashing, another is green wishing. So, for example, greenwashing essentially it could be uh, attention deflection or outright lying, simply put, right? Attention deflection okay. is are 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 deflecting the attention from something else, uh, saying that okay, you are green or you are, uh, for example, if it's a cosmetic manufacturer. You are saying that you are using only plant-based products and not any chemicals, right? So Swiggy and Zomato actually are telling that they are carbon neutral. I still don't understand how, by the way, because if you are using a diesel and petrol bike, how could it be carbon neutral unless they are taking the electric electric vehicles out, right? So, so, so my opinion is that, yeah. So it is, it is, uh, yeah, greenwashing. As of now, people are not being held accountable. But there could be a day where uh, legislations will come and uh, make people accountable for that. Yeah. So as of now, so greenwashing remains a big concern, but uh, the regulation hopefully will catch up with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So going to the next question. So uh, it's from Prabhakar. Uh, Prabhakar has asked, uh, need to know the part of USG in product design and sales. So. Uh, would you like to share your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, again, I'm not only talking about financial services industry, but uh, if you observe uh, one of the reference uh, slides which I put, specifically on the ING Bank's sustainability criteria, there is a right. three lines of difference. Then second line, third line, right? So the first line or the front line managers, so they are 
targeted training sessions and they are supposed to complete the training sessions by this December in order to be able to go and pitch the clients uh, to maximize the sustainability related deals. So that goes with education of the frontline personnel, so number one. So yes, sustainability has become a part of the frontline, first line discussions with regards to what kind of product do we offer. So given a choice between offering a traditional loan or a loan which will advance the uh, green principles or ESG related metrics, the banks or financial institutions will choose the ESG related loan a lot more because that will give them brownie points also. So yes, it is a fact that it is already part of the product design. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that answers Sujinda. Yes, I, I, I think so. That answers the question. But yeah, as always, I mean, if you have a follow up question, please uh, put up uh, and we'll be, uh, we'll be happy to take that. Right. So um, next question is Gunjan, uh, is from Gunjan, sorry. And uh, the, the question is, what is the role of company secretary in e ESG? Uh, would, you, would you like to share a thought on that as well? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, so uh, it's a very interesting question, right? Now, yes. it's a very interesting question because as a company secretary, you obviously are accountable for the statutory and uh, SEBI or uh, related compliances, right? Uh, which, uh, especially with the statutory and regulatory filings that the company has to make. So, in that sense, a company secretary's role will become much more important uh, in terms of how is that you are obtaining the data regarding ESG related metrics. Uh, every company, every annual report, if you pick up, even non-banking companies, even IT companies or manufacturing companies, everyone has to report the ESG metrics. So the question, the company secretary's job is important to the extent of how are you sourcing the data? How accurate is your data? Is there any, you are accountable for all the data that goes in the annual report, right? So in that sense, it's a legal compliance risk. So tomorrow if it is found out that you are just making a green claim and when in the audit, you are failing, so that's a direct hit to the company secretary's credibility. So in that sense, having an awareness of climate risk and ESG related aspects is extremely important for company secretaries and they have a very big role to play in that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, I, I hope that answers your question, Gunjan. Now, going to the next question is from Priya. And uh, the question is like, how will any MSc or PhD environmental science can work in ESG? Very good question. It's, it's a direct, it's a very directly related uh, profile, right? So environmental science or PhD probably would be the best suited person uh, for, for ESG consulting roles or for ESG risk analyst role or for ESG uh, sustainability officer role or for financial analysis role. So there could be four different roles, right? I mean, I mean I'm just starting to think on this, right? You can be the financing uh, person, you can be the risk management person, you can be the chief sustainable officer or you could be the climate risk modeler. All of them requires very solid understanding of uh, climate risk. So, for example, even for my ACR exam, I really had to brush up all my environmental and climate science related concepts. What is carbon dioxide? How is the whole? What is lithosphere? What is atmosphere? What is the difference? Right? Uh, and what is ozone layer? So, right. it certainly puts a very good and with an additional quantitative training, it will. It will be the best combination, in fact, I would say, right? Uh, a degree in environmental science with the knowledge of financial risk modeling will cook in a very good stead if you would like to go for financial institutions, banks, or any other company as such. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so that, that have a, absolutely, I mean, uh, background with environmental science, MSc or PhD is, of course, very suitable to make a career in this field. Okay, so the next question is uh, uh, from once and he has asked uh, what type of digital platforms and tools can facilitate slash enable banks to issue green slash SLL loans. Any opportunities for IT services and SLS in this area? Yeah, like to answer yeah that very good question. Again. Yeah. yeah, it's a very good question again. So, <laughs> no, there are two ways we can look at it again. So, 
the the green loans uh, SLLs and the sustainable bonds you can look at technology the IT sector right in the entire value chain right from prospecting to sourcing to lead generation to product optimization and to forecasting in terms of okay what could be the variables that I can put as a part of this transaction right so the entire customer life cycle right from prospecting sourcing lead generation customer acquisition customer servicing right the, in all these aspects the information technology can certainly help because you need you will be able to provide the digital tools for visualization for data visualization data modeling data manipulation number one number two you could go next level if you are using artificial intelligence you can actually create a model which can look at your server usage across the different financial institution and across your infrastructure and try to see where can i do load optimization so that the overall power or energy consumption can be reduced and so and hence the carbon dioxide uh, reduction also so you can actually use a ai model uh, which can run all these simulations so there's a lot of impact that you can make number one on the customer life cycle entirely number two on optimizing your own because for information technology you need servers right you need computing power they will take energy that energy also will create carbon dioxide emissions so both ways you can impact yeah absolutely i hope i hope that i i hope so i hope that answers the question and again as i as always uh, please uh, feel free to type in a follow-up questions in case uh, you have some more points to discuss on that Right. So next set of question is from Tejasvita. Uh, in fact, it's like uh, three, four questions which I will uh, combine together that she has put up. Right. So first is like, where can we get the 2023 climate report? Uh, next part of the question is not sure, but was it taxonomy report? Where can we get it? So I mean, it's like a continuation of same first question. Yeah. And yeah. also she so asked, uh, so what is? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Please, I mean, continue. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, I'll ask the second part of the question later on. Uh, yeah, so we will be able to share. This is a publicly available information, friends. So if you go to ING website, you can get the ING climate risk report. I will share it with Nitish, and Nitish can share it with you all of you. Number one, the EU taxonomy is also from the European Central Bank or the European Banking Association. So it's also publicly available information. So but having said that, I will share with yourself, I will share with Hitish, and he can share with all of you. Yeah. But it's 600 right. pages, so you need to have time to go through it, by the way. <laughs> of course. Of course. And then second part of our question is, what is ACR certification? A for America, ACR certification. Okay, I'm aware of the... Uh, SCR certification, which is Sustainability and Climate Risk Certification, and also the which is which is uh, given by GAR, uh, which also administers the the world famous FRM certification, and also the CFA uh, uh, ESG investing investing certification. These are the ones which are pretty much uh, quite popular and quite widely known in the industry. Uh, but I'm not sure about ACR. Uh, uh, but but still we'll we'll find out on that to be honest right but but I've seen mostly it is the uh, GAP or the CF Institutes one which are much more popular in the industry and have more takers yeah I, I probably think you probably went this year yeah yeah they just with the, I mean uh, do feel free to uh, add up to that I mean did you mean SCR or it, did you did you mean ACR Right. Anyway, uh, so uh, for the timing, which well as answer the question, please feel free to put up a follow up question. Next question is from Arindam and he has asked any input on the carbon emission control possibility for the ocean carriers moving across the country so that the loan financing gets easier across the borders of any country. So can you, do you like so, to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, please try to search for positive principles. So these are the principles if you observe 
I have also shown uh, in the in the presentation, right, uh, for the shipping industry. So yes, you are right. Ocean carriers are one of the biggest guzzlers of energy, but uh, and and that's why the Poseidon principles are the founding basis for the shipping industry. So so please do refer to that. Uh, it, uh, there are quite a lot of actions on that, but the simple answer is uh, uh, carbon dioxide tons emission per vehicle kilometers is again the same metric which is used for ocean carriers also and that is an active area of research the banks also are trying to push the shipping companies to be more green so in that sense there is a quite a lot of action on reducing the carbon footprint from the uh, uh, ocean vessel yeah. right <coughs> okay so though uh, you have uh, mentioned about acr a couple of times but there's just there are couple of specific questions where people have wanted to understand forces that has climate risk and ESG, right? So any certification that we have. So if you can just uh, mention to them, I mean, uh, it, it, this is a common yeah. question that people have asked. Yeah, yeah, these are the courses, right? So of course, Nitish mentioned about one of the ones which uh, will be uploaded. But as such, uh, the GARP uh, ACR, Sustainability and Climate Risk Certification is more relevant for someone who is focused on climate risk as a career. ESG, uh, CFA, ESG investing is suitable for someone who is more focused on the investing side of things. Global reporting initiative certification is for someone who want to be in the reporting side of sustainability. So yeah, right. so these are the usual ones that are pretty much selling in the or pretty much big in the market. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so another question is from Tejaswita again. So ESG, sustainability, re renewable energy, climate risk, are this all interrelated? So of course it is, but again, would you like to add anything on that? Absolutely, Tejaswita, I think, yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, in one of the set, third, fourth slide, uh, that's what I mentioned, right? So climate risk, ESG have quite a lot of overlaps. Uh, sustainability is a broader one. Within that, environmental social governance is, is a part of that. Renewable energy predominantly focuses on the environment side of things. Right? Uh, so how do we reduce the carbon emissions? Uh, so in that sense, you can call sustainability as the master set, ESG as the subset, renewable energy the subset of environment. Yeah. Correct. Hope that answers and your question. Yeah. I hope so. And a follow up on that is for a beginner, uh, where do you suggest where to start from step to step into this field of USC sustainability and all? So suggestion for beginners. Yeah, so this webinar itself is a good suggestion, right? So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so I think you can. Uh, so, so there are uh, we, uh, there are some of course, courses available online also, right? Uh, so your starting step, of course, would be to go through what has been discussed today, right? Uh, which this will be sharing, uh, and and probably that can give you a very good starting point uh, in terms of uh, do you want to go for a formal certification? In which case, the certification which I mentioned always helps, or you just want to learn more. In which case, you can pick up any of the balance sheet of any of the banks or any of the companies it could be any industry and see how is that they are moving towards uh, meeting their net zero targets right and there is uh, a website also uh, called as ipcc so uh, intergovernment panel on climate change or uh, international energy association these two uh, are the think tanks so you can go to their websites also and and start learning what they are talking about yeah absolutely yeah. all right so going to the next question so it is from kulveer and he has asked i'm more interested in empirical research on climate finance do we have data on this in indian context yeah so in india so i have in the presentation which i shared i have shared the global data as of now right uh, so india is a bit slow in climate finance so europe is very high uh, as of now we would need to research for the data. We can do that, but uh, India is not that big <coughs> as of now, unfortunately, in climate finance. 
uh, I think we have just started setting up the policies. So out of the 600 billion of climate financing, India share would be far lesser as compared to Europe or Americas or, or even China for that matter. Yeah. Absolutely. So hopefully we will see more and more coming. Let's see. Correct. All right. So this uh, next question is from Vaiba. Though uh, this is something we have uh, you have already touched upon during your talk. But again, maybe just to uh, if anything can be added. So he's uh, Vaiva Rajdi from Indian Institute of Ecology and Environmental Environment, Sikkim University. And his question is that what role is played by developed developed countries in reducing the climate risk? They need to fund the developing countries to meet their emissions. <laughs> so so that, 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 in fact, if you observe in one of the <coughs> In fact, in the COP27, the Conference of Parties, there was a formal in principle agreement. We said yes, developed countries will give a fund towards developing countries. It requires billions, but earlier COPs, or every year this meeting happens, did not come to any agreement. But at least in the COP27, which is last year, they came to some agreement in principle, though without the target that, okay, we will look into it, we will try to provide a fund for the developing countries. So now in COP28, which will happen this year, which is already happening, I think, you will get to know if there is any uh, progress or not. But the simple answer is, developed countries have had their share and through their emissions only, they achieved their growth. So now it's a time for developing countries. So in order to for the developed country, developing countries, which includes India, Brazil also, by the way, uh, they would need some investment in technology or it would also need, the, the money also is needed to provide support to the displaced people. So tomorrow, if you say coal power plants are being shut down, what will happen to their jobs? They need to be compensated for, right? And okay. reskilling of them for new technologies also will need money. So yeah, so that's a that's a simple thing that developed countries can do. But which is the most difficult thing as of now? Political issue also. So let's see. Yeah. Absolutely. Next question is from uh, Megha. So I mean, now we will be taking up only the three, four quick questions because we have already oversuited our time. Since the session has been very interactive, so yeah, of course. Uh, we would like to take up all questions and we have almost uh, taken up most of the questions now most of the questions are common but anyway uh, we'll take up three four uh, quick questions which are uh, still there unanswered and then we will wrap up the session for the day right so the next question is from mega and uh, she has asked uh, a sustainable transition is only possible when it remains people centric what's to what steps should we take to ensure that this transition is equitable how do the current policies support this objective you know, that's a very good question, Mega. That's exactly the point, which is why it is called as a transition uh, risk. It is called a transition risk. So banks have to disclose what is their approach and how do we make it equitable. Now, equitability, equitability is a very tough task to achieve, right? In India also, top one percentage of the population owns 40 percentage of India's wealth unfortunately so there is a lot more action that is needed through regulation possibly right uh, and also to education in the society so hopefully both of these top down and bottom up approaches will help but let net uh, yes uh, the example that i just gave right the power plant example so if it has to be equitable and justifiable the transition plan has to be uh, well laid out, well thought of, looking at all the parties involved. Number two, it needs to account for the loss of employment and the loss of livelihood. It also needs to account for future reskilling towards new technologies of the people. So, of course, all of this requires funding, which is the most important thing, right? Uh, and the plan, yeah. So, so, so that's the way, it's not easy, but, uh, and also probably taking the example, for example, Sweden, has achieved same or higher amount of growth than UK. But Sweden, through its regulatory mandate, 
has been able to preserve most of its forests despite the growth that they have that is only possible through regulation right and active people people also being very active in that uh, whole whole process so it cuts both ways yeah sweden can be a good example to take that equitable uh, yeah approach yeah absolutely absolutely so the uh, next couple of questions is from ashna so first question is that uh, she is doing an mba in sustainable management from terry university should i focus should i focus on getting into consulting first such as big four and then move to organizational sustainability strategy how should i chart my career any advice for her so 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 yeah it's a interesting question again it depends on your individual situation which you can catch up uh, with the fish but uh, no i uh, see consulting <coughs> see there are two things right one way to look at is you start with consulting and move to organization another is you gain experience on the ground to see what is realistic and what is practical and what are the challenges and then move to consulting in which case you will have more credibility in terms of you can tell whatever strategy you want to tell but if it is not backed up by implementability and uh, uh, and if it is not credible then uh, people will not be sold right so i would probably say it cuts both ways try to get some internships if possible on the ground with some organizations which are implementing sustainability initiatives maybe 3 to 6 months at least to get some knowledge and leverage that for consulting so that when you say when you when you advise something it should it would come out as not a theoretical conceptual stuff but someone who has actually been on the ground has looked at what has happened and can tell some best practice stories in order to make your consulting pitch more credible so i would probably say uh, you can have some internships and then probably choose consulting yeah absolutely i think uh... That's uh, that's quite helpful, uh, Ashna. I mean, it hope answers your question. Uh, so the next question yeah. is also from Ashma, Ashna, and she has asked, "What can we do to stop chasing the EU rules guidelines and move in front of that car so that our organization do not face do not face shock, shocks such as CBA?" So the question is, why should we not? Why are we not having our own regulations? Is that the question, Ashna? Um. Yeah, in fact, actually, what she is trying to ask is, uh, uh, you see, instead of instead of chasing EU rules guidelines, so I mean, she she says that why should not we move in front of that call so that our org organizations do not face shocks such as CBM. So I mean, she, I, I think what she mean, meant is that maybe why would not be more proactive and like have our own guidelines which actually uh, can come right. before right. even right. EU rules and guidelines. Why right. should we always be followers? Right. Correct, correct, exactly. So that requires people like you, all of you. There are so many interesting and intellectual people to start uh, taking active part in the proceedings of the country, right? So you can actually put a blog post in Medium. You, you can continue to advocate uh, uh, environmental related concerns when you go out for clubbing or when you go out to college or your job, right? It starts with us, right? Uh, equally, Equally, I mentioned my own example, right? So yes, equally, I must say that it's a, it's good to take uh, best practices from someone, but customize it to us, right? So our legal policy is also from England, but we have customized it, right? Whatever, again, without having any shame or any this thing, uh, it is not necessarily about who is the first. It is about who is the effective person, right? So maybe we can take the person who is the first, and take their example and use it for our own benefit. But having said that, India, with the national hydrogen policy that I mentioned, uh, there has been a quite a, a bit of uh, more proactiveness coming from India uh, in terms of, uh, especially on the uh, green uh, energy and uh, uh, climate risk policy. But more can be done. But, but certainly, I think they are with the national hydrogen policy and a public target announced with renewable energy to be 70 percentage by, of the total by 2030. I do believe that we are in the right direction, uh, but, but certainly there is nothing wrong in taking best practices from others. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
so it's always useful to uh, use something which is always there instead of reinventing the wheel but you are right i mean we can always take proactive steps but if something is already there some work has already been done there is no harm in using that work and then bettering it so both is like okay now yeah. i'm going to the next question from shalu yeah shalu uh, i have already answered that question so will climate risk and management also be part of risk management course yes shalu i mean our quantitative finance and risk management course uh, from the coming cohort itself uh, with the batch starting from 6th jan so we would be uh, we would be including climate risk as uh, part of that cohort so yes to answer your question it would be part of uh, our our other courses as well as well as we'll have specialized courses on climate risk of oh, so that there are three four more questions which will uh, would you be kind enough to take that or take those up as well yeah yeah i'm i'm still sure all right so very quickly now going to three just three more questions uh, since there are like few more but i just collating the questions and uh, uh, just mention that so first is like from nitesh uh, nitesh uh, mentions sir uh, how will corporations measure their carbon footprint and put them in the report if no one is doing it measurement process is key so yeah i mean any standardized right, right. measurement process already there okay so there are two two aspects which are very good question again so one is the you you obviously you have the scientific instruments which uh you can use right but the greenhouse gas protocol is the binding uh protocol for reporting of carbon emissions so uh and there is a generally available proxy right in terms of okay per per kilometer of rail rail transport how much is the carbon dioxide usage uh which is been scientifically established so all you need to do is okay take the reference take the proxy and calculate multiply by your own uh, actual uh, amount of travel plus travel that you did or the amount of coal that you purchased so in fact in fact if you look at the eu taxonomy uh, one of the flights actually shared okay what is the metric towards per unit of coal generated how much electricity is used there is a general standard that people have come up with because it's been done for a very long time so you can take those proxy and reference and then calculate but whatever that calculation approach is is governed by the greenhouse gas protocol which is an official uh, reporting framework so if you are not in compliance with that obviously it's an audit issue so those, that is the standard yeah yeah absolutely right so uh, next question is from vic and he has mentioned can you take scr certification without having any cfa frm qualifications yes absolutely it's an independent certification it does not have uh, yeah you don't have to be in cfa or frm to do a scr certification it's independent some knowledge helps but certainly the material is quite uh, good and uh, if you put some efforts and take some guidance it will be pretty you will be you will be good so yeah it's not a pretty quick yeah yeah absolutely right so next question is from ronak and he has asked uh, how can people from geo spatial analytics that is gis uh, public remote sensing experience in data and programming enter the field of climate risk analytics could you kindly brief out a road map of steering plan to make a complete uh, competent profile Uh, would you like to guide him a little bit yeah yeah so absolutely so you are probably a very good fit right uh, so geospatial analytics will like really really help in assessing the physical risk of the plant right in terms of it, okay you can actually use your iot knowledge also to map out okay how the weather patterns and climate risk patterns are impacting your facility level details and how prepared what are the hazards for your particular facility if it's a manufacturing or a financial company so you can basically choose modeling as a career in, in one sense right climate risk modeling uh, would be the right path with your technical knowledge of geospatial uh, engineering right in fact that is one and geospatial engineering can also give you a career not only just as a climate risk modeler but also as someone who can 
mitigate the climate risk also. You are not only doing analytics, but you can also mitigate the climate risk by supporting companies which are working in net zero and towards these ambitions in terms of uh, uh, creating strategies that can reduce the carbon dioxide. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. So geothermal energy is one big source where you 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 kind of uh, uh, and it's an interesting one. Basically, Earth is very hot, right? Uh, inside the core of the Earth, there is a mantle, there is a, there is a core, and you just dig a hole into it, put water into it. Uh, it will it will get heated up, and that will create steam, which will uh, power a turbine. So you can actually do, uh, use your knowledge in that space also, yeah. which is not a uh, uh, which is not a commercial technology as of now. So you can help there also. Yeah. True. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is uh, from uh, Mohammed Nadeem, and he has asked, uh, uh, "Will you please explain how can we measure environmental protection?" regulations on environmental sustainability and he's from kurukshetra university so that will be the last question for the day if you can uh, answer him so 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 environmental protection if you if you again one of one of our slides talk about different ecosystems right friends uh, which is a uh, uh, mangroves cover how much of land cover we have how much of uh, uh, ocean cover we have right so right what are some of the metrics which tell how good the environment is? Number one, percentage of greenery that directly impacts the amount of carbon dioxide you pick up. Number two, the habitat, which is the biodiversity. Now, it's not only one type of tree. It is the natural biodiversity that will help create the balance in the ecosystem. So that is the second metric. Number three, on land, the percentage of rainforests and the percentage of mangroves. Rainforests are the ones which absorb the highest amount of carbon dioxide. Mangroves help in avoiding flooding. These are the four. The fifth in the oceans is the coral reefs, the percentage of coral reefs that are available, which is very important for marine biodiversity. And marine biodiversity is important because oceans capture pretty much half of the carbon dioxide that is, that is lying on Earth. So they are a big sink of carbon dioxide. So these could be the five easy factors that you could think through. Yeah. Right. All I right. So I, I hope that yes, I hope that answers your question. I mean, so with that, uh, 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 we have come to the end of the you know, the questions. So so essentially, I'm glad we could answer all the questions. Though we took up a little bit extra time, but since the participation was huge and enthusiastic, so. Uh, thought of extending a little bit and taking uh, all the questions. So thanks Ujwal for your uh, wonderful session and then your uh, in patience in answering the, all the questions. And to the participants as well, uh, it was a lovely audience. So, I mean, very happy to see so much participation on a weekend. And uh, you, you were kind enough to be present while the session got extended a little bit while answering your question. So thanks, thanks so much for joining. And uh, as I said, with that, uh, let's uh, conclude the session for the day. Thank you, everyone, for joining and keep following us uh, in our very various channels, your website, social media pages. Uh, I mean, we regularly conduct webinar on important topics related to advanced finance, financial analytics, risk management, algorithmic trading, machine learning, financial engineering, and all these aspects. So keep keep tracking on, keep tracking us, keep following us, and uh, hope to see you in all all the future webinars. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Nitish, for organizing this. And it's always a great association with you. And uh, many, many thanks to all the participants. So it's, it's a massive turnout. So, that shows how important this topic has been, friends. So, yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. So, and thanks a lot for pushing through with the questions. Also. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for Thank you, time. everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.